Hey everybody, this is Taylor Hokinson from DIYLALCNC.org and today we're going to be talking about Pinewood Derby. Now this is a tutorial based on a request that we got on our forum, so uh, if you enjoy this material feel free to request your own um, your own tutorials. We're trying to show people all the different things they can do with CNC and in particular our kit, the little CNC. Okay, so two URLs that are important to this tutorial. We've got um, pinewoodderby.org and irhino3d.com. You can really use any 3D modeler for this process. Uh, I prefer Rhino because it is both professional grade and also relatively inexpensive. However, if you are on the Macintosh operating system, you can't pay for it at the moment, but you can get it for free. Uh, again, it's uh, irhino3d.com, and all you have to do is fill out an application to be a, a so-called beta tester. You don't have to do anything, but they'll send you links to uh, temporary builds of Rhino that last for a couple weeks or a month. So it's a good way to uh, see if you like the program on the cheap before you go ahead and decide to invest. But I can just tell you right now, I've taught it for many years, and uh, I think McNeil and uh, their products are great. Okay, so in addition to irhino 3 d I also took a look at uh, pinewoodderby.org, and I'm sure that in the uh, in the technical Boy Scouts applications of Pinewood Derby, there's all sorts of rules about weight and materials and so on, so I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to show you the general process of building this kind of shape, uh, first in a 3D modeling program and then outputting it to CNC. Uh, we'll probably break this into a couple of videos. So you can see here that the general shapes for Pinewood Derby uh, tend to be pretty simple. You can imagine laying a block of wood down on a, uh, on a uh, bandsaw and cutting this thing all out in one pass. So clearly the average Boy Scout troop does not have access to a CNC, although uh, that could be changing. I hope it changes. So we're going to show how first you can accomplish this sort of shape, uh, even though there's no real reason to do it with a CNC, beside the fact that it's uh, fun and very repeatable and uh, gives, uh, gives kids an extra wow factor. But then we'll also show you how to make more complex shapes which suit themselves more directly to the capabilities of the CNC. Okay, so that's Pinewood Derby, iRhino 3D. I'll pull up Rhino and we'll take a look. So this is the beta version, a work in progress. Alright, so when you open up just about any 3D modeling program, you're going to see a perspectival view, right? That shows 3D objects, how you and I perceive them with uh, the naked eye. We've also got a variety of isometric views, which means that if I had two parallel lines traveling into the distance in an isometric view, they would never appear to converge as they do in a perspectival view. So that this is um, convenient if you're trying to communicate um, measurements and so forth, say for example in a drawing and you want somebody else to produce an object, you don't want to necessarily render things perspectively, you want to show exactly the dimensions uh, at each point so somebody can, uh, can make a fabrication for you. So I'll close this file, and I was just working on a little preview right here. Uh, so uh, this is the shape that I arrived at, and I want to show you uh, how I got there. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my layers window. It looks like a little, uh, a little piece of cake. I'll make myself a new layer and make it the default. Therefore, everything I draw at this point will land there. And now I can hide these two layers and start from scratch. Okay, so we don't care about the perspectival view yet. In fact, all we care about is top because we're going to start with a basic outline drawing that will be flat and then we'll extend it out into the third dimension so that we can arrive at a complex 3D form. First I'll pick the rectangle tool. I could also type these in, which is a very convenient way once you get fast. I'll start with the origin here at zero and then as I type in dimensions, I'm typing in X and Y and Z if, I, if that happens to be part of that tool. So let's, let's make our working envelope about 6 inches by, say, 2 inches. That looks about right compared to the images that I saw on pinewoodderby.org. Next up, I will grab uh, one of these curvature tools. This one's called a control point curve. And I'll start here in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, you can see that my cursor is snapping to the grid and also snapping to 90 degree increments. So I'll turn off orthographic. That'll give me a more... Um, refined uh, set of selections. I could turn off snap if I want, but I kind of like the regularity of how it helps me make choices in a more um, consistent fashion. Let's give ourselves a cab here. All right, so my wife fam my wife's family knows a lot about cars. I do not. Uh, I'm going to make sort of a, um, a janky Camaro here or something like that. You can see I've just selected the, uh, the polyline tool, which lets me make totally straight lines. 
And then as I come around the bottom, I'm also going to make these notches for uh, where the axles would go. I'm guessing that these are uh, thinner in the real world, uh, so it just depends on the materials that you've got. Again, I'm just showing you how to get this done on the computer uh, modeling side. Okay, I will click and shift click the two lines I've already drawn. They connect exactly right because I've had the snap tool active. So now when I hit join, these little puzzle pieces, uh, that'll come up as you see here at the bottom into one closed curve. And that's important because when you extrude this out, if it's not a closed curve, you're not gonna wind up with an airtight solid and that causes all sorts of problems. You also heard this referred to as, uh, as watertight, as in I could pour water into it and none of it would fall out. Okay, click here on my little plus in the, um, in the top title, and now I get my perspectival view. Let's expand that one and pull this thing out into space. So I'll start typing in extrude. I want to find extrude curve. I could just do this visually, but since I've already been experimenting here, I found that two and a half inches look like a pretty good extension. You can see I've also got cap selected as one of my options because I want this to resolve as a solid object. So I'll type in 2.5, and that's going to take me two and a half inches into positive territory. Now our car is looking pretty good. We do want it to rest level on the ground so I could get a better sense of uh, how it looks. So to do that, I'm going to type in rotate and select rotate 3D. To make this work, I want to have my not O-snap selected. And I'll click here and here to set up the axis around which the car will rotate. I then need a reference point. Think of it like the top or the, uh, say for example, the top of the uh, lever that I'm going to be pulling. So I click there, and then now I can pull this thing down into space. You can see that uh, I've arrived at a teachable moment, which is an accident, <laughs> where I accidentally had my uh, polyline selected instead of my solid. So hit escape, escape again, select the solid object, rotate 3D, set the axis of rotation, set the reference point, and now I can pull this thing down onto the ground. Uh, depending on the operation you're trying to accomplish, you'll find that sometimes you start in one window and end in another when you're trying to tell the computer what it is exactly that you want. And that's the car that I created. Okay, so in a separate video, I'll show you how to make a more complex car and then the differences between these two cars when they go out to um, post-processing and tool pathing for CNC.